Ladies and gentlemen, to part D of our lab of analyzing movies using um, can, uh, using uh, class uh, classification and regression trees, CART. But um, now we're using we're going to start using the R part package, the recursive partitioning regression trees package to do our tree analysis. All right, our card analysis. Now remember, our, our part is the cart implementation in R, but it's essentially doing the same thing. So we want to use this R part package, and it's actually incredibly easy to use to start doing our analysis on our movie data. But before we do that, we want to actually understand what's happening. We want to learn about how our part does what it does, so we have a better understanding of how the analysis works. Um, we also want to get an understanding of the metrics behind that is being produced uh, when we actually train and then test our data. So we start off with first, we want to work on a data set, not our movie data set. We have our movie data set and we will go back to it. But first we want to use a new data set that is a actually popular data set called the Iris data set. And it's basically a, a data set of 150 rows of flowers that, that you know, species, Setosa, uh, I forgot the other ones, but we'll, we'll see them in the, in the slides. So there's three different types of flowers. And in this, we essentially use this table called iris to I, to predict, given the sepal length, width, petal length, and width, we, ex, we actually want to predict what ki kind of species of the flower or iris we're dealing with. There's three in this data set, and we want to use this data set to actually learn and get more comfortable with our part. The reason why we're doing this is because the iris data set is a very popular data set that is used for these purposes of learning regression, learning different time machine learning algorithms, because it's so good at being a very clean, it's easily, uh, it's, a, it's a very clean and easily, very easy, predictable data set. And so that's why we want to use it so that, you know, we can get clear, concise answers and it can help us guide us in understanding what, how our part is doing what it's doing. So for this particular lab, what we're going to do for part D, we want to basically use, we want to basically do a machine learning algorithm, or in this case, on one using uh, trees, just to, just, we want to create, use trees to do our algorithm. We want to create a, a tree, classifying tree. And we want to use, once we design and make our classifying tree, we want to use that classifying tree to make predictions. All right, we will do all that. Now, because, like I said, Iris is such a, this Iris data set is such a popular and famous data set, it actually comes preloaded in R. So here, let me create a new file. I should call this BML Lab 1. Keep it simple. Zoom in a little bit. And if you just simply type, type in data, and then the, na the name of the one you're looking for, in this case, I'm looking for Iris, puts it automatically in quotes, run it, and you see up here you have something called values, right? Values up here. What we're gonna do is, we've just downloaded the Iris data set. And like I said before, the reason why R comes preloaded with this data set, and many other data sets like it, is because these are, they're, these are famous data sets that are used for purposes of teaching machine learning. I'm going to go ahead and convert this table into a data table just to make our life easy. Remember the command to convert any standard table into a data table is just set DT. Type in iris here, press enter. And as you can see over here, it looks like it's been converted into a, a table. Click on this and this is what I was talking about. You can see the four columns, sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, where these four columns are basically going to be used as our independent columns. And species, the flower, this is going to be used as our dependent column. So we're using the same, if you guys, some of you have noticed, we're using the same um, language as we use with regression, linear regression. We're using the same language, but the type of algorithms we're running and the way we're doing this prediction is totally different totally different but it's I mean there is some sort of overlap because of the fact that and we talked about this before in the previous slide because of the fact that we have this concept of of independent variables and dependent variable 
this is considered a supervised a su supervised classifier or learning model as opposed to an unsupervised learning mo model for my ABI students the clusters right when you're doing clustering that's considered unsupervised clustering all right so now we have the table and we're ready to jam now again I want to stress that we are, our, the model we're, we're, we're training is going to, we want it to basically take the SIPO length and width, petal length and width, to identify the different flowers. Just for your own purposes, a SIPO is, is basically, SIPO is pretty much like those little leaves that wrap around the flower petals when they're blooming, right? So here's a good diagram. So this is the petal, this is SIPO, and by understanding the width and length, we can identify these flowers, which is pretty cool, which is pretty cool. Uh, there's a unique, there's a cool little function called table in R. And what table does is table takes a column or vector of values, and it basically counts how many times that a particular value is in that column. So for us, as we see over here, we have species. This is our going to be our our target. This is going to be the the column we want we want to predict. This is what column we want to train to to find to uh, train to predict, and then we want to go ahead and start attempting to predict, uh, given all this data, predict what these flowers might be. So if I were to just run table, on the species you can see. There's only, like I was saying before, there's only three unique flowers. Satosa versicolor virginica. And it's equally distributed. There's 50 of Satosa, 50 of versicolor, 50 of virginica. Right? Again, table function is very nifty in doing that. We'll use it later on. It actually comes in very handy. Right? Also, we can, this is another interesting, and this is also my ABI students, you guys know this, the STR function. This function also allows you to see the internal structure of an R object, a data table in our case. And the reason why this is coming into play is because we can confirm that, you know, not only does it have the, obviously, the, the column names, we can see that clearly from our, from our table up here, but what this allows us to see also is the type of column each one is. So length, width, length, and width for both table and petal are both numbers, numeric, fantastic. All right, so that's numerical inputs coming in. Species, on the other hand, and again, for my ABI students, Factor, remember what a factor was with three levels, Satosa versus color versus sign. So, um, factor, remember again, that's the key word in R for a categorical column. And just as a refresher, a categorical column again is basically alphanumeric values. Like any, any uh, data set that you cannot apply mathematical calculations to, right? It doesn't need to be, I mean, you can have a column that's a number. But that number might represent something. It might not be a number. For example, um, if you're flying first class, you can have the designation one. So middle class could be designation two. What middle class? I mean, economy. Right? Economy, I guess, economy plus could be two. Economy could be three. Right? So even though, you know, in your flight, it's given the number one, two, or three, that one, two, or three is not necessarily a numerical column. It's not something you would add up or take an average of. It's just categorizing something. It's a cate categorical column. Here, this is obvious as species of the categorical column, right? They're, it's just names and words. So it's already set up, right? Obviously, because, you know, R took care of this when it, we loaded up in data. So it's already a categorical column. Now, I bring this up, right? I, str I stress the fact that it's a categorical column because this uh, matters in the type of um, tree we're doing or machine learning algorithm we're running. And you'll see that in a, in a few slides. You'll see that in a few slides. But, before, but another thing we want to know before we, we go on is that over here, you can see it's clearly if I do it from here. Right? As I scroll through, you see that you know, the species and the flowers, they're all grouped together in the table. The first 50 rows is Satosa. The second, second set of 50 uh, rows is versus color. The third set of 50 rows is Virginica. All right. Is that a bad or good? In the world of machine learning, 
that is not a good idea. That's actually a very bad. We don't want that. We want to avoid that. Because the order of which you're providing the data and the algorithm is learning, that is also important. So if all your setosas, your verse, all your different classes are grouped together, it's going to create a very biased, uh, it's very a biased machine learning algorithm or classifier. The classifier is going to be very biased and lean towards, um, lean towards, lean towards uh, splitting rules that take that basically assume that the data is stacked together like that. We obviously we don't make that assumption, right? And we don't want to make that assumption. So we need to shuffle the data, right? Just the same way how a dealer shuffles the cards, a deck of cards before you guys start playing it. We need to shuffle the data. And the way you shuffle the data, right, is we can use, right, there's there's so many different ways to shuffle the data, right? But we can use the, the feature of how, you know, in a data table, we can call each individual row. Like here, this is, the, I don't know, this is the fifth row. This would be the 10th, 50th row, et cetera, et cetera. So we can call... All right, did I run this? Oh, why is five and exactly the same? Let's do another one. Ten. All right, let me get some variation. I was getting worried. So, right, we can. What's the logic here? We can randomly select rows in Iris. Right, remember, I don't have to do it one at a time. I can give a vector of rows right here. For 180, 80, etc. And, you know, I get back these four rows, but I'm getting back the fourth row now, the first row, the 20th row, the 80th row. Like I'm shuffling it myself, right? I'm shuffling it myself. So, what we can do is we can simply just take a random set of numbers from 1 to 150, right? 150 because we have 150 rows that you can see from here. We have we have 150 rows of, of uh, data. So I just need a random a vector of numbers from 1 to 150 randomly ordered, right? Randomly ordered. And a nifty little function that allows us to do that is called a sample function. Very powerful function. Very cool. Right? So what sample does is you give it a number, right? I mean, it, there's many ways to use it, but the simplest way to use it is you simply give it a number. In this example, I gave it the number 10, right? And it'll just generate, randomly generate numbers from one to 10. If I show you here, right? That was one example. I have seven, five, six, three, two, nine, and one, wherever you see that, I'll run this again. And you see another set of numbers were generated, random numbers were generated from one to 10. Right, and I run it again, and another set. You see that? All right, it keeps randomly generating numbers from one to whatever you put in within the parentheses, in this case, 10. For our purposes, we're going to do the same thing, except we're not doing up to 10. We are doing it up to 150. Bam. Right? So you can see these these are basically, this for us, this is, this is going to represent row numbers that are randomly generated. We're going to take these row numbers from our original iris table. We're going to plug it in and we're going to randomly get these rows and we're going to plug those rows and in, into a whole new table that will be shuffled. Right? So that's basically one. Again, there's multiple ways to do this in R. This is one of many ways to do it. But a straightforward way is that I'm just going to take the original table, randomly put numbers from row numbers from one to 150 randomly in the row section and just select those rows and put into a whole new table right and so that's why here remember i use this fancy little code here i'm simply saying you know what i'm calling sample directly in this in the iris table so the new table i'll call it iris.r.r dot .r for random and here in the table i'm going to call the sample sample function, but instead of explicitly just putting 150 in there, right, I'm going to, 
right? I mean, we should we should be a little more dynamic. I'm going to use the nrow function. Remember, the nrow function, all caps, basically just tells you the number of rows you have in the table. And then I'm going to give it the table name, iris. So I'm, if you notice, I'm calling iris in here. That's what's basically what's happening. This nrow iris just simply gives me the number 150. So rather than just doing sample parentheses 150 like I did in line 114, I do nrow iris, and that way my code is a little more dynamic for any kinds of data set. I just wanted to point that out what's going on there. I run this, right? And now iris.r is that new table where is the new table where the rows from iris are being called in random order. In random order. Like for example, if you want to see from here, give this as a as a uh, guide, hypothetically. The first row in iris.r would be the 137th row from iris. The second row in iris.r will be the 59th row from iris. The third row in iris.r will be the 138th row from iris. And so on and so on and so on. And that's why we create a whole new table using randomly selected rows from iris. So iris.r again is the same table, but it's shuffled. And you can see now. Satosa virginica, and then a whole stretch of virginica, some satosas, right? So we got this whole table that's now shuffled. All right, from here, we are now going to do the next step, which is create our training data and our testing data. Now, when you typically, when you're doing machine learning, supervised machine learning, when we have a, a data table or any kind of data set, we always break up that table randomly again. Our, our table's already randomized, so that part where it's already done. But we randomly break up our data table into two parts, the training data set and the testing data set. Why do we do this? We do this because first, we want to use some of our data to train the model. We want, it, we want the algorithm to learn from the training data and basically come up with split, uh, splitting rules right? Splitting rules that will basically help us do predictions. And you guys will see how we do, uh, you will see how we do the predictions. All right. The second set of data is the testing data. Now, what's the testing data for? Well, once we train our model and then we use our model to do predictions, we want to see how accurate that model was. So that's where our testing data comes in. Our testing data, what we do is we take our tested data, testing data, we run it through the model, our predicting model, prediction model. And we check and we see what predictions were generated. We then look at those, we then compare those predictions to the actual results to see how well the model did, to see how well the model did. So that's what we're going to do. So from a training data, data point of view, there's generally some rule of thumb. So um, typically it's anywhere from two thirds of the data set is, is used for training data or up to like 80% or 80% of the data is used for training data. So training data is the bigger is the bigger is the bigger piece. It's anywhere from two thirds of the data set to 80% of the data set. Okay, for our purposes, what I'll do is we're going to take 70% of the data, use that for training data, and then leave the other 30% for testing data. And likewise, if you use two thirds of your 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 data is being used for training data, then one third is being used for testing data. Uh, same way, if you're using 80% of your table for training data, the other 20% is being used for testing data. All right. So for our purposes, I'm going to create. I, I would. I mean, typically you can create two different tables to do this, or you can just, um, like here. Let me just give you an example. So I can basically, if I wanted to, I could just say iris.r.training, and I create a whole new table from iris.r. Right, and I could randomly select out uh, seventy percent of the data, right, and then I could have, or I could just simply have done one colon one hundred five because seventy um, seventy percent of one hundred fifty is one hundred five. Thirty percent of one hundred fifty is forty five. Right. So, but I mean, I don't have to technically. You can do it like this if you want, and then I would, I would do the testing data like this. Right, you can do it this way if you want, and then call those tables when you use it. But in my in my in my table, what I did was I simply said, "Listen, I already 
I already shuffled the original data set. Iris.r is the, is the randomized data set. I'm just going to take the first 105 rows, which is 70% of the data, as my training data, and my, um, my last 45 rows as my testing data. Right, so I'm not gonna explicitly call these tables, but again, I just wanna show you that if you wanted to, you can do that. Typically, I mean, there's different styles with, with uh, data scientists. So either or is fine. I'm just gonna go ahead and use, use the slicing method right here. And I just wanted to point this out just so that when you see me do this later on the slide, you know where it's coming from, what's going on. All right, so now we're ready to use our part to build our classification trees. Now we have to install our part, okay, and then call the library in the code. So let's go ahead and install it. Again, it's very simple. Come over here, lower left, lower uh, right hand window. Click install, type in our part, and there it is, and click install. Oh, so for me, it's already loaded. For me, it's already loaded, so I don't need to. So that window popped up, so I'm ready to go. You go ahead and install it. You see a few things happen. And now I'm going to, in my code, after after it's installed, I'm going to go ahead and source the package R part in my code. So it's in the memory and it's ready to go. All right. It's in my memory and it's ready to go. From here, I'm going to call R part. R part just takes three parameters. It's very, I mean, um, I shouldn't say it just takes three parameters. It actually gets pretty complex. Um, but to just run it right off, right out of the box, you just need three parameters. The first parameter is the syntax that's similar to regression, where you state your dependent variable, followed by a tilde, and then after the tilde, you just followed by all the independent columns you want to use, or independent variables that you want to use, to attempt to make a prediction, that you want to use to make a prediction. All right, or you want the machine learning algorithm to look at to, if it needs to use it to make a prediction. Those are always to the right of the tilde. To the left of the tilde is the dependent variable. To the right is basically your independent variables. All right, your second parameter, right? Your second parameter. Also, um, here you see I wrote sepal.length plus sepal.width plus petal.length plus petal.width. If you didn't have me for ABI, that plus math is not happening. That plus basically means this independent column and this independent column and this independent column and this independent column. That's what that plus means. Okay, that's what that plus means. All right, the second parameter, what is the second parameter? The second parameter is your table, right? The table of data, you're basically your data that's being used to train the data. Now notice we put iris.r in there, but I put iris.r just the first 105 rows. Remember, our first 105 rows we're using as our training data. The other 45 we want to save for our testing data, right? You don't want to use the same, you obviously don't want to use the same data used to train the model to test it as well. What's the point of that, right? You want to have a separate set of data for training, a separate set for testing. So that's where the, that again, that one colon 105 is coming from. The third parameter, we put class in for quotes. That means that's short for classification tree, a classification tree. Now, why do we choose classification? In this example, it's actually very straightforward. It is because our, um, our, our target or our dependent column or the column that we're trying to predict, whatever you want, however you want to describe it, is a categorical column. That is why I stressed that point before when we did the str command, right? I, want, I pointed out, hey, this is species is a categorical column, species is a categorical column because... Once it's a categorical column, once we are predicting something that's considered a categorical column, the method we are using in our part is the classification method. So we have to put a class in there. If you don't define what the method is, by default, it's going to be ANOVA, a method called ANOVA. ANOVA is, is made for numbers. We will we'll discuss that later. All right, discuss that later. That is when your but you're predicting is something of a numerical sort. Your, your prediction is something that's numerical as opposed to categorical. All right, so those are the three parameters. Um, if we go back to the first parameter right here, I'll show you guys yes, in, in the R code as well. R part is smart enough to understand that if you're using all the ta all the columns except for your dependent, except for one, the, if you define what your dependent column is in R part, 
and you're using all the rest of the columns as your independent columns. You don't have to explicitly write the names of each column. You can simply just put a dot there, and our part will understand. In our part will understand. All right, so that's basically what that dot. So you can write this syntax any which ways. I'll write both ways, just so you guys can see it. So here, M1. Also, you know, you define what this model is. So I'm here, to, I'm going to define this model as M1. So M1 will become my train model. Again, this is just a variable name. You can call anything you want. But M1, in this example, when I, whatever you do to the left of the equal, that will be, that, that variable will be representing your train model. So in this case, M1 is my train model. All right. First, I want to put my formula again, which is going to be species tilde. And I can write, let's see. It's easier if I just do it like this. I got my species tilde. And I said I'll write it both ways. Simple dot length plus width. Put a lot length plus width. All right, so I got my first parameter ready to go. My second parameter is basically data. What data am I using? I'm using iris.r. Just the first 105 rows. And finally, my third parameter. What method are we using? You know, what are we really predicting? You're, you're helping our part. You're telling our part what it is. So we are doing a classification tree. Go ahead and I run this. And then we want to set. Likewise, same way. I could have wrote this same syntax. So my, my model's trained, by the way. That's how easy it is. All right? Tra running these models off the shelf, they're so easy. That's not the problem. That's not what the complexity is. Right, the complexity is is on interpretation and analysis on metric on the on the metrics around it, the analysis around it. So here I wanted to show you guys again the same way to write it. Because I have simply I'm using all the columns that's not species. I'm basically using all the columns that's not species to do the prediction. I can just do the dot right again. Uh, oh, sorry, what happened? Somehow I lost my data. There you go. And you see it, it works. All right, so here I ran it twice. So I have M1, and M1's ready to go. From here, if you simply type in M1, all right, you get a nice little summary, a simple summary of what is going on. All right, so first it gives you the amount of rows you use to make this model this machine learning model, this uh, tree algorithm, this, this tree, classifier model. Here, now, after that, it gives you a nice little uh, legend or map, if you will, to what data is being presented below that. All right, so here, uh, the node, we started with the node. The node right here, basically, this is defining what node or what point in the tree you are at. Right, so here, root, this is our original data set, our 105 rows, so it's called root. Okay, after that, this is the, that is the one node. After that, the one node is split into the two and three node. After that, the two node is split into the four and five node. All right, four and five node. This is my current model, right? If I come here, when I made these slides, you notice that it's slightly different. My slides here, I had the one node that was split into the two and three node. And unlike here, you see here, the two node is split into the four and five node, and the three node is not split, further split. But here, my three node, my two node was not split into four and five node. My three node was split into the six and seven, seven node. What's going on? Ah, there is an element of randomness going on when they run these algorithms. And we'll talk about that a little later when we do a deeper dive into how our part 
how our part, our part attempts to do its um, its splitting functions. Right? When we do it, when we do a deeper dive to figure out how not too deep, right? Because um, there's a whole book on how these algorithms work. But I mean, a general synopsis of what's basically happening. There's a randomness element to it. So that's why I'm getting a different result now here from when I first ran it. And likewise, as you guys run it, your results will be slightly different as well. Your results will be slightly different from mine as well. So from here, all right, if we focus on what's on the screen right now, uh, the next keyword is split. What is split? Split is our split function. Obviously, our root part does not have a split function. Down here, all the subsequent children, they do. Here, it's telling you the node 2 is basically saying what, what created it, what rule created it. This was the rule. If pedal length is less than 7.5, it's going into node 2. And then if we go to 3 here, if pedal length is greater or, than or equal to 4.75, it's going to node 3. Likewise here, you'll notice the rules are different. This is pedal length less than 4.75. Here is pedal length. It's, it was still pedal length, but it's now less than 2.6. You see that? You see that? Element of randomness. The next one, um, N. So this is also basically saying, all right, at each stage, right, how many, at each stage, how many were uh, predicted uh, not predicted correctly, but basically, how many were uh, how many data sets did I have at that point in the in that particular data set? So here, notice we for root we don't have a split function. We go straight to n. There's 100, 105 elements here. Here we have 60 elements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right here we have 27 elements in the data set. 33 elements, 45 elements. Loss. Now what is loss saying? Loss is basically how many misclassifications there were in that particular node. Now, what the heck does that mean? What does it mean by misclassifications in that node? Well, at each node level, the node is making a prediction, if you will, a localized prediction. And based on that prediction, right, that's actually the next value over YVAL. YVAL is actually the uh, prediction made at that stage, if you will. By prediction, basically, if the analysis, if this tree just stopped there, based on the splitting rule, what would the prediction be? That's what basically it means. It means that up until the predictions, the splitting rules up until this point, what would what, what prediction would this tree make? Right? And then based on that, whatever prediction it makes, in this case, look at the second node. It says versicolor. All right? So if... There is the only rules up until this point was pedal length less than 4.75. So for any data element that has a pedal less a pedal length less than 4.75, it's going to be predicted to be a versicolor. All right, that's what this part y val means. Okay, so if that is what the prediction is at each level at that point, then loss is basically if the data is supposed to be predicted to be versicolor. The data in this data set right now, are they all versicolor? How, if they're not, how many are not versicolor? That is considered loss. All right, that's the loss. That's the one. That's basically the uh, elements in the data set that are not versicolor. And in this case, we have 27 that are not versicolor. Right? In this case, this is predicted to be virginica. Five of them are not predicted to be virginica. And obviously, if you go down even smaller to the 4 and 5 versus Sertostan Versicolor, you notice it's better, much better. It's zero, all right? Obviously, as we go lower down, better predictions are happening. After YVAL, within the parentheses, you have something called YPROB. That's the probability breakdown of each species, all right? Let me break it down like this. So here at the root level, you have 25%, 36%, 38%, all right? And then you have something called Virginica. What's happening here? What is this? Alphabetic. So you, we have three classes, three unique classes here. Right? If we type in, if I type in the table command again. All right. I have three unique classes here. Satosa versus color Virginica. In alphabetical order, they gave us those names. Satosa versus color Virginica. Likewise, because we have three classes that can be predicted, 
they gave us three percentages that go hand in hand with each one of these predictions. And it is those numbers, they come up in alphabetical order. So this right here represents Satosa. This represents verse color. This represents Virginica. So on, so forth with the rest of these. All right. So what are these probabilities all about? It's basically telling you what percentage was predicted correctly. That's what it's coming down to. So at this level, it's saying, hey, anything pedal, any pedal length less than 4.75, it's a versicolor. Well, in that case, 45% of 45% were uh, misdiag mis mis we'll call it misclassified as Satosa. 55% were accurately uh, identified as versicolor, and 0% were identified as Virginica. All right? That's what those percentages are. These percentages within the parentheses have to add up to 100%. Right? And let's look at a more extreme version here. Here, Satosa, you'll notice, and Versicolor, you'll notice they have 27 and 33 observations, zero, zero losses, meaning zero misclassifications. And when we come into the parentheses, you can see, ah, yes, 100% of the data set, of the data in, at this node was identified as Satosa. 0% was identified as Versicolor, 0% was identified as Virginica. I come down here to the fifth node or fifth subset. Again, zero misclassifications. 33 sets of data, zero misclassifications. It's predicted to be Versicolor at, at this point. And again, when I say predicted to be Versicolor, when I when we when we graph this out, it'll be clear to see what I'm talking about. All right. So if this is the case, if this is zero, we can see zero percent were misdiagnosed as Satosa. One hundred percent were accurately uh, predicted to be Versicolor. Zero percent were zero percent were identified to be the Vir Virginica, where where they need to, when um, when they need to be a Vir Versicolor. You see that. That is what these percentages mean. The breakdown is basically the breakdown of the data set in percents. In percents. So this is what this nifty little tree and data give us. Now, obviously, there's a lot of numbers going on here, right? There's a lot of numbers going on here. So uh, an easier way to visualize this is to actually graph it. Right, and to actually graph it, a nifty little way to graph it, guys, is to use something called R part plot. R part plot. Right, R part plot. Now, again, you're going to come here. Type in R part plot. And click install. And again, I'm going to have this thing that pops up and goes all nuts. Mine's already installed. I'm going to go ahead and type in the library and call it in my memory. Bam. All right. Our part plot is very easy to use. All right. And remember, like, we want to visualize it because one of the actual benefits of using classification trees or regression trees to do our analysis is that the model can actually be visualized. That is one of the benefits. That is one of the benefits. So here, I call in, I just do a simple R part dot plot my model. Bam. And you know, it's slightly different than the one in my slide. My one in the slide has my my keys down here to the right, right? And uh, instead of Versicolor, my first child being Versicolor, oh, actually, my first child, uh, 
child is bursa color, but it's slightly different. Here, it's the pedal length causes this no to happen, yes, this to happen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But let, let me guide you through what's happening here. All right. So we start off with our node, our root node. Now remember that prediction was Virginica. If you see that right here, Virginica. From here, our first splitting rule it happens. Is pedal length less than four point eight? No. Okay. If it's not no, then it's a, then it's then it's uh, going to be predicted to be a Virginica. All right. So anything that's uh, four point any any flower that has a pedal length. 4.8 inches, four, whatever, 4.8 of uh, 4.8 inches or greater, I think centimeters, 4.8 centimeters or greater, right? I forgot what the uh, the scale we're using, but let's just say 4.8, whatever, 4.8 or greater, that is automatically considered a virginica, right? Because here's the splitting rule. This is the first splitting rule, bam. Yes, okay, we come down here now. Right now, the next rule, splitting rule, there's another splitting rule that says pedal length less than 2.6. Now notice in this case, and this is the beauty of this, we gave it four columns. Pedal length, pedal width, sepal length, sepal width. They created this, they, our part created this model, this classification model, just using one column pedal length it used it in two steps first it said if pedal length is less than 4.8 bam it's a versa color right then if pedal length is less than uh, 2.6 then it actually broke out versa color and setosa you see that whereas here in my slide when i first ran this uh, it did pedal length 2.6 and 4.8 as well but it, diff it did it differently instead of doing uh, less than 4.8, greater less than 2.6. It did less than 2.6 first, then 4.8. And you guys might see the same thing. You may or may not see the same thing, guys. All right, you may or may not see the same thing. Now, um, our part has our part plot has many, many. It's very cool, very visual, but it has many, many different options, parameters to make graphs to look the way you want. I'm actually going to put its manual, little PDF manual on canvas for you guys to look through it and check it out so you guys can see how to work it through how to work it and see what you want to do with it uh, to customize it i gave an example of how i can simply just type in this right here Fix that. All right, right here. I put in these additional parameters: type equals four, extra equals zero. These all mean something, right? And you'll see that in the manual. And all of a sudden, let me zoom in. All right, this is a little easier to see. The graph looks different. See that? It actually looks cool. You know, the leaf nodes are down here. And your uh, interior nodes are over here, right? It's not much going on, but it's, it's actually a cleaner, easier way to see it. I actually like using um, this way to do it only because it has to break down at each level, right? And in, in the interior, it has to break down each level. Like, for example, here it's giving you the, the percentage breakdown, 37%. Um, Satosa, 31% Versicolor, 31% Virginica. Right, and then it comes down here, and these percentages right here, 100%, 60%, is basically the data breakdown, how much data is in each set, right? So here it has 100% of data, here it has 60% of data, 30% of data, 29%, 34%. These percentages should add up to 100%, all right? And so at each point, it's giving you the breakdown. Oh, now I have, when it does this breakdown, it has 50% Versicolor, 50% Virginica, and then when it breaks down further, it says, oh, cool, 90%. Virginica, 8%, Versicolor, et cetera, et cetera. So there's more information there. So I like that. Interesting. Uh, one of the things I forgot to mention, all right, here, you notice these little star dots right here. You know, what are these star dots? That, I, I totally glanced over that. That star dot denotes terminal node. 
So anytime there's a node that has no more children, that is considered a terminal node, and the star symbolizes that. Obviously, visual, you can, when you visualize it, you can see it much clearer. This is a terminal node, this is a terminal node, that's a terminal node, these three down there are terminal nodes. All right, and again, you can make a lot of cool little art. You can get really fancy if you want with it. I put the uh, manual up there for you guys. All right, now, we got, the, we got our model, yay. Let's make our predictions now, right? And before we make our predictions, let's test to see how good those predictions are. How are we gonna test those predictions? We got the test data, guys. That was the whole point. We got our test data. So here we go. Right, and again, the predict function is something you guys should be uh, familiar with because if any of you guys have done any kind of regression, use a predict model for that again. The predict model is universally used for any kind of model that you're using to make any kind of prediction. So again, like before, I'm going to, prediction is going to literally give me a set of results that it predicted. That is why I'm defining P1 as a, a data container because P1 will store those predicted results. Whatever predict predicts, it's kind of, kind of getting kind of wordy. Whatever predict predicts, P1 will store those values. And you guys will see what I'm talking about. So the first parameter for predict is the model that we're using to make our prediction. In this case, it's M1. That's straightforward. The second parameter is our data by which we are going to make the predictions. In this case, I am doing running my test data because I want to see how good the predictions work. What's my test data, guys? In this case, it was the last 45 rows of iris.r. And so I will use, now I will now call the last 45 rows of iris.r. And finally, the third parameter, just like when we were defining our, just like when we were um, training our tree model, I have to tell, predict, hey, what kind of prediction are you doing, right? What kind of prediction are you doing? You're doing a classification of prediction, right? These are um, categorical data you're predicting basically, right? Now, what's cool about this is you'll notice that as I'm doing P1, here I run it, done, predictions are done, right? But you'll notice I called the whole table iris.r with all the columns. The species column is still in there, right? The species column is still in there. What's happening? M1 is already trained. M1 is already trained. It knows that, look, if I want to make a prediction, I need four columns there. I need sepal.length, sepal.width, uh, petal.length, and petal.width. It doesn't matter if there's additional columns in iris.r. It's not looking at that. M1, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in conjunction with predict, are using looking for those four columns in this table that we selected to make the prediction. So we don't have to go out of our way to, to specify those four columns. M1 already knows those are the four columns it's looking for. And it tells predict, hey, I'm looking for these four columns I'm making the prediction. All right, so that's why you might be wondering, why did I not specify one column or the other? I don't need to because M1's already trained to look for the columns it needs to make the prediction. Right, and again, type basically is telling you, hey, it's a category, you're making categorical prediction. Right, it's a classification. All right, so we go ahead and we execute this as we did. And here, this is the part I was talking about. When I just typed in P1, all you're getting back are what? Virginica, Satosa, Satosta, Virginica. You're getting predictions back, predictions. So basically, from using the data from row 106, in sepal.length, sepal.length, petal.length, petal.width. In this case, I think it's petal, just petal.length, which is the only thing it's, this model is looking at. But given the values in petal.length in row 106, it was predicted to be a Virginica in line 107. Given the data, the, given the independent data, it was predicted to be, our model predicted to be Satosa. In um, line 108, given the data, our model was predicted to be a Satosa again. And let's see, 16, 17, 18, 19, in line 109, 
given the independent data, the pedal in again in this case, the data of the model was predicted to be Virginica. All right, predicted to be Virginica. And you can see that again, if I were to simply just grab and show you guys a little tracing. Line 106. Right, look at our model here. Oh, the model's kind of screwed up. It's a little crazy here, but I think we can make it out. Right, so here's our line 106 data. We need pedal dot length. Here's pedal dot length. It's 5.6. So I come here. See, it's just easier this way. I come here and make this smaller or bigger. All right, this is easier to see now, guys. So I come here. Here's my row 106. All right, it's saying pedal dot length one point less than 4.8. What is my pedal length? 5.6. Is it less than 4.8? It would go here. It's not. So it goes here. It goes straight here. So automatically right off the bat, this row is predicted to be Virginica. It's predicted to be Virginica and we see that up here. Okay. But also from this row, what do we see? We see that, yes, we, 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 know, we know from this from this chart and from the output up here from P1, it was predicted to be Virginica, but we also know, oh, you know what? It actually is Virginica. So this model predicted, predicted accurately that this model is going to, that this row is Virginica. Wild, right? And subsequently, that's what's happening. That's basically how these models work. That's how the prediction is happening. Same thing is happening for line 107, line 108, line 109, et cetera, et cetera. The predictions are happening, and we can go back and compare with the actual values. Now that we predicted everything, we want to go back and now compare it with the actual values. That is why. That is why we break up the data between training data and testing data. Training data and testing data, right? And the testing data allows us to see, hey, how good was this actually? Because we actually had the real answers in our testing data, right? So we can see that we can calculate the predictions and then compare with our actual values. And for any of you guys that have done this in other classes, this allows us to make a confusion matrix, right? Confusion matrix. And it's real easy to make confusion matrix. You just use the table command. You can just use the table command. So the way the table command works, before we just gave it one column of data, now we're going to give it two columns of data, guys. The first column of data we give it is the actual numbers. The second set of data we give is the predicted values. All right. So my actual right answer is going to be from iris dot r. It's going to be the rows 106 to 150, just the species column. All right. This right here is my actual right answers. My second parameter for table now, because now I'm giving it two sets of data, not just one column, but two columns is going to be my predicted values, which is basically just P1. But I'm not going to just put in P1 because I don't know if, I don't know about you guys, but I always get confused <laughs> in the confusion matrix. What's the rows and what's the columns? On the rows is the actual data, on the columns is the predicted data. So we can just simply just type in, to make our life easier, predict. Predict or predicted, right? And it puts a nice little label up there next to the columns, right? So down the rows here, these are our actual values in the blue arrows. Across the rows are, are, are I'm sorry, across the rows are actual values. Going down the columns is our predicted values. Okay? What this happen with this dynamic, what ends up happening is everything on the diagonal was predicted correctly. The blue lines, everything on the blue arrows, everything on the diagonal was predicted correctly. Anything not on the diagonals was predicted incorrectly. In this case, the red arrows. In this case, the red arrows. Alrighty? So, if that's the case, if we're just eyeing this, right, if we're just eyeing this, this is actually pretty good. This is actually pretty good. So, Tosa, 
was perfect, 23. See, from here we can see that the actual number of satosas was 23, and the predicted number was 23 as well. From here, if we go down across the row, we can see that there were actually 12 versicolors, 12, there were actually 12 versicolors, 11, 11 of them were predicted correctly to be versicolors, one was incorrectly predicted to be virginica. Virginicas, going across the row, there were 10 virginicas, nine of which were predicted correctly, one of which was incorrectly predicted as versicolor. So as you can see, the satosas were, for whatever reason, no, there was no confusion there, right? The versicolors and virginicas tended to be, if there was a mistake, it was one for the other, one for the other. Satosas were okay, all right? They were A-OK. -okay. So now that you have this confusion matrix, this now allows us to use machine learning metrics or our confusion metrics, whatever you want to call them, our calculation, our calculation metrics, to actually analyze to see how good this prediction model really was. And here I show you, I give you the formulas for some of the most popular metrics we look at. Accuracy, precision, recall, sensitivity, specificity, the F1 score, right? F1 score, which we'll, we'll talk about some of these a little bit later, right? Right off the bat, the more popular one that we like looking at is um, accuracy, which is the overall performance of the model. We'll get to that point. But also precision and recall. Precision and recall. Um, precision and recall tend to be among the more uh, accuracy, obviously, it's, it's very popular, right? It's very popular. Here in a two by two matrix, it's very easy to see how the calculation is it's calculated. It's basically everything on the diagonal divided by all the boxes. I mean, that's pretty much what accuracy is. For our example, it would be everything on the diagonal divided by all the observations. So it basically would come out to 20, 11 plus 14 plus 16, which comes out to 41 divided by um, 41 divided by 45, right? And that would basically give you, 41 divided by 45 would give us our overall accuracy score for the model. Precision now, precision and recall. These two things you'll hear about a lot when it comes to machine learning, I, I, when it comes to machine learning and data sciences. I have one student from the MBA program she actually started doing this stuff right when she was taking my BAP class. And I talked about this in my BAP class towards the end, right? And she was doing all this lingo. I'm actually going to bring her back in the fall to talk about her job a little bit. So it'll be a very good, um, I guess, interview or lecture with her small lecture, mini lecture. I'm just going to just call her in to do a little presentation. So she talked about how when I talked about recall, precision, um, precision and recall, how in her meetings now she understands what the heck the data scientists are saying and she better has a better understanding of conversing with them. This is this will be everywhere. Precision and recall, first of all, precision is basically when a prediction is made, right? Basically, the probability that that precision is correct, that prediction is correct. That's what precision is basically saying. Recall is saying, okay, given that there's a specific class in the data set, how good is your model at identifying that those classes? Now, they seem like they're the right same thing, but they're actually opposing forces. Precision talks about the individual precision, the individual uh, probability that a, a prediction made is correct. Whereas recall is basically saying, hey, how good at, are you at finding all? So recall talks about all those classes. How good are you finding at all those classes in the data? And these are actually opposing forces. You see, the higher the precision, right, by definition, your recall will get worse. Because if you want to be very, very precise about something, let's say, let's give our example. If you want to be very precise at identifying a flower as a tosa, as a satosa, by definition, that means then you are going to misclassify some satosas as something else. You're not going to identify all the satosas. But when you do identify a satosa, it will be a satosa. That's what precision is talking about. And the other on the flip side, recall is saying, okay, you're very good at identifying a satosa, but you're not good at identifying all the satosas. 
right, all the satosas. And if you wanted to be good at identifying, finding all the satosas, then by definition, what's going to happen to your precision is going to go down. There's going to be situations where you define something as a satosa, and it might be a versicolor or a virg virginica. So recall, recall and precision, or sensitivity is something called, they're at opposing forces of one another. They're at opposing forces of one another. Very cool feature in machine learning, uh, in, in terms of metrics of machine learning. All right, because, because they're opposing forces, we always want these things to be high as possible. Now, you can't have both be as high as possible. There's always a trade-off, and we can talk about that a little bit later. But um, the calculate, let's go ahead and calculate precision. When it's a two-by-two two class, it's easy to calculate precision, right? It gets a little confusing when it's not two-by-two. Two. In our case, we've got three-by-three three matrix, so how would we do it? Well, precision, it's very, it's very straightforward. Precision, all right, precision is your predicted columns. It's your true positives, all right, divided by your true positives and your false positives. All right, it's your true positives divided by your true positives and your false positives. All right, so I come here and I, um, in the two by two matrix, you'll see that here's a true positive, here's a false positive. I basically have to take this number and divide it by the sum of these two numbers right here. You're doing it column by column, guys. That's basically what's happening. So here, if I want to calculate the precision of Satosa, I'm basically going to take 11 and divide it by the sum of this column, which is 11, which is why I get a 100% precision from Satosa. 100%, right? And in a strange twist of fate, if I want to calculate the recall, the recall, again, is now the, the addition, the math going across the, going across the row. 11 divided by 11, 100%. So both the precision and recall, two metrics that are supposed to be opposing factors, by the way, they're both 100%, 100%. And again, this should be, uh, this should be evident to you why we start off with the iris data set, all right, to do this, because it's so clean and it gives you results that you would never see anywhere else. You're never gonna see precision and recall both be 100%. That doesn't happen. All right, so let's go to Virginica. What is the precision for Virginica, right? What is the precision for Virginica? Well, 16, again, you take your, your, your true positive, and then you divide it by your false positive. So here's a false positive, here's a false positive. So 16 divided by 19 gives me a precision, precision of 84%. Again, on the flip side for Virginica, right, if I want to calculate the recall, so here, in actuality, there were 17 Virginicas, but only 16 were identified. Therefore, my recall comes out to 94%, right? 94%. Now here you see, my recall is actually better than my precision, right? And that's usually the way it goes. One's always better than the other, because again, they're opposing forces. Again, for Versicolor, its precision is 14 divided by 15, and it's Recall will be 14 divided by 17. All right. So these are some of the more basic, more popular metrics or measures we use to do our tree. Now, we just did one measure of a tree. There's more to this. Firstly, I'd like to point out, we took one random order, divided up and took 80, you know 70% of the data and for training the other 30% for testing data, and we ran through the predictions. Great. In actuality, we do several of these simulations, right, by first training our model randomly. Well, we would do, now we, would do, we would do a couple of different phases of this. We would take another phase where we randomly select a different set of 70 rows as our training data and a different set of 30 rows, right? This is called K-folding, K-folding. And again, we could talk about this later. So at this point, we made our first machine learning, uh, I say, I got what we call it, our classification tree machine learning model. And we used it to do a prediction. So welcome to data science. Now, obviously, there's much more to this. And we're going to have to open up the hood a little bit more to see what's going on. Um, and we'll subsequently be doing this, going down the rabbit hole of, with this, uh, with the R part algorithm. Not all the way. I'm not, I won't get all into the math, but a little more into it, I guess, their parameters and uh, you know how, how the uh, splits are chosen, all this stuff. There's a lot of questions here as to why it did what it did, right? And why is it that when we run the model again, it's randomized. So all these things we have to discuss in our future class, all right? 
But either way, students, uh, this is the conclusion of Part D. And I will see you in the next video or in the next class. All right. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.